I have a new typewriter. I might have a bit of a problem here. So here it is. It's so huge I've had to bring it out onto my dining room table, which is why I will probably sound quite echoey due to the absence of acoustic insulation in here. So what this is, if I open the lid, is a M-Office WP1 uh, integrated word processor typewriter appliance. I believe this is a rebranded brother WP1, which makes it the same lineage as the other word processor I have, which has uh, shown up on my channel a few times before. What this is, if I turn it on, is a turnkey unit that allows people to write out documents uh, using the very nice uh, rubber dome keyboard, which apparently feels a bit like Topra if you've ever used a Topra, which I haven't. Uh, and then you can either save them and load them from floppy using the integrated drive here, or print them out using the high quality daisy wheel printer. Now, I happen to know that on this model, the printer is broken. Plus, while it does take the same daisy wheels that my other brother device takes, it does not take the same uh, ribbons. And as a result, I can't print anything on this anyway, even if it did work. But I will briefly demonstrate just typing on this so I can uh, dog chips over the lazy fox. So this is the Swiss keyboard layout. So you can tell by the accented keys here and the fact that Z and Y are swapped, which is kind of awkward when typing. This is a actual letterbox CRT. My other unit has an LCD, but uh, compared to that, this is so nice. I'm not sure how well it's coming across on the camera, but it is beautifully crisp. It's a little bit fuzzy around the edges, but it's really comfortable to use. The position of the keyboard is well judged and it feels really nice to type on. Unfortunately, okay, what have I done now? Cancel, there we go. Unfortunately, the CPU in the computer that runs this thing is a rather slow Z80 and it's not really very nice to use. So like if I press return, it doesn't keep up with my typing. If I insert text, oh, um, and, and of course it predates insert, so uh, it defaults to uh, overtype. So I, so I switch to insert, there we go. It says insert down there in German. Uh, all right. Once upon a time, there was an aardvark named Albert. So I'm still waiting for it to catch up and those beeps you were hearing are warning me that its buffer has filled up and I will have to wait while it catches up. You see it's actually missed the last few characters. E-R-T dot. So yeah that is no fun. The uh, the other unit I have is faster, but it's still kind of slow. People did write long documents on these, but compared to modern stuff, it's not great. So to demonstrate the floppy drive, the floppy drive is also, as far as I know, broken. If I try to do something with a file, it makes horrible noises. That's actually normal. The floppy drives and these things are weird, but uh, it correctly detects that the disk is not formatted. So I say ya yeah to format it. And it grinds away. 
and then it gives up. It says that the disk has failed. So that's not so great. So I, excuse me, I would like to take this thing apart and see whether I can make it work rather better. So uh, I am going to uh, turn this thing off, turn it over to access the works and show you what's inside. Well, here it is with the lid off. Dismantling it was rather tougher than I was expecting. Not because it's difficult, just complicated and unobvious. The knob here that uh, you wind the paper on sticks out through a hole in the top case. And you can't lift the case off because this is sticking out through it. I tried to take the printer off several times uh, before just realizing that the roller itself just lifts out there are some plastic clips to remove it. So you're supposed to take the roller out, then the top case comes off, and only then can you dismantle the printer, which is really awkward. Also, the, uh, the electronics is split between the top half and underneath. The logic board, which is this, actually lives in a hatch on the underneath of the machine. And all these cables, go through a hole in the bottom and connect up to the logic board. So you can't lift any of this lot off without also turning the thing over, removing the logic board. And of course, you have to take the logic board out before you can unplug any of the connectors and free up the cables, which is really annoying. But it's done. I'm reasonably certain that I can put it back together again. I have lost a couple of screws inside the case, so I'm going to have to turn this upside down and shake it at some point. But I think that I'm now going to move stuff through back to the workbench where I can get a proper look at it and show you what this thing is like inside. Well, here it is on my workbench. It's still far too big, so you can only see it in pieces. What you're looking at here is the print mechanism. This is the print head. It moves back and forwards across the paper. There's a belt down here and a stepper motor, which you can't see in there. The print wheel, uh, the daisy wheel that contains the actual uh, type elements, goes in here and locks into place. It then rotates and this thing has got a solenoid that hammers each type element against the paper. Uh, the ink cartridge drops in here and of course the only cartridge I have is the wrong size. This is the motorized drive that is supposed to drop into a cog like this in order to wind the ink ribbon along. Interestingly this printer has a second uh, ink ribbon which is white for doing undos, which is interesting because given that this is a word processor, you can undo all your mistakes actually in software and then you print out the correct version. So this suggests that whoever owned this uh, was used to using it for typing in direct mode, where you type on the keyboard and letters come out. Anyway, the print unit comes out by unclipping some little things here and then it just lifts off. And it's connected to this metal sheet, revealing Uh, that thing is heavy and really awkward, but revealing the insides. Now what we've got here is power supply, the mains plugs in here, the switch, the on off switch is under there. I don't know what this is. Um, a choke for smoothing, maybe. 
Um, that kind of main stuff is kind of out of my comfort zone. A monster transformer from old-fashioned linear power supply, so this does not use a switch mode, I think. Uh, this is the low voltage generator. Now, I said I think because there is a little transformer here, so who knows? But I don't see any electronics on this, so maybe not a switch mode. It then powers the motherboard via this connector and the monitor via this connector. This is the monitor's analog board and I am really not an expert on these things but it looks pretty normal. You've got the high voltage uh, flyback transformer here, a um, couple of, oh yes, this connects to the What's this connect to? Uh, this and this bundle of wires connect to the tube, which is uh, underneath this shield. Uh, that will be the yoke, which contains the magnetic deflection coils. This is the electron gun itself. Uh, this cable is supposed to plug onto the motherboard and it contains the actual signal. And, if make that visible, the really interesting bit is it's got a coax connection. And I think that connection is likely to be composite video. However, I do not know what the other three wires are. So, that will be something to find out. We have a focus control. Uh, some other pots that, well that one's labelled height, I can just see and I'm not at the right angle for the others, but I have no intention of touching any of this because I want to live. Moving over here, and I'll slide it back a bit. This is the floppy disk drive. It connects to the motherboard with these two connectors. This is not a standard floppy drive connector. I will remove and disassemble this to take a look inside but given how weird it is, I don't think I'm going to go to very much effort to make it work. I would like it to work because then I can use this machine to test the Flux Engine's ability to write 120K Brother discs. But given that a floppy disk in this thing will store 120K, that's really not a lot. So here is the logic board. Now, this is quite different from the logic board of my other brother word processor, which is a later generation. You can most kindly describe the other logic board as economical. It's a nasty yellow PCB, which is single-sided. It's got very few components on it. It's made out of very cheap PCB material. It's clearly been stripped down to its minimum. This is much more sophisticated which is interesting because this is the earlier version. Now, it's the, both machines are based around this chip, which is a HD64180. It's a uh, modernized Z80. It supports a larger address space and a faster clock rate. It's got loads of onboard peripherals, which is why it's got so many pins. Uh, while the other board had uh, ULAs, gate arrays, for doing nearly everything, including the video signal. This has an actual uh, video controller chip, and uh, I've, maybe, I've been able to find a datasheet for it, which is nice. This chip is 8K of static RAM. Maybe video memory? But that's confusing, because this chip is a ROM. I don't know what's on it. I would think that this would be a, uh, a character ROM used by the video chip, but if that was the case, it wouldn't need 8K of video memory. So that will require some investigation. I really hope I don't have to take this chip off and, to, and read it. Uh, over here we have 64K of RAM. This is DRAM. All of this is generic TTL logic and drivers, presumably to make the printer work. 
I believe that this gate array here has got to do with working the printer. This one over here, I think, is handling addressing, sending requests from the CPU to all the various uh, bits and pieces over here. Now, there are a lot of connectors. This one is the keyboard, and I would expect this to be hooked up to a UART on the processor. The processor, I believe, has two built-in UARTs. It does have quite a number of pins, though, so that will need investigation, too. Uh, here we have the two connectors for the floppy drive. These are wired up to this chip, which I haven't been able to identify, which means it's probably another gate array. This would be the floppy drive controller. Uh, I put controller in quotation marks because, as I said earlier, these machines do nearly all the floppy drive handling in software uh, with a big chunk of code running in this thing. Presumably that's to make the floppy drive interface cheaper, but if they're having to use a custom gate array anyway, why not just use a off-the-shelf floppy drive controller? Because that way you'd be able to get more than 120k on a disk, which is ridiculous. Up here we have a connector that's wired up to... Uh, this is the safety switch on the lid so that it won't work the printer when the lid is open. This one is the video out, so I'll be looking at that. We've got power in, lots of pins. I bet that this thing has separate power supplies for the heavy duty motors for the printer and for all the logic. This ribbon cable here connects to the print head and these two to the printer itself. However, most interesting to me is over here. This looks like an expansion connector, and in fact, when this board is in the machine, this lines up with a cartridge slot on the side of the machine. So clearly they were thinking about expansion, but uh, why then did they never populate it? There should be a plug on here for some reason. So who knows? Uh, and there's another couple of connectors here, which are also interesting. Um, no help from the labeling. It just says port 2 and RA1. All these ports are numbered. So, there's no, I mean, there's no kind of maintenance manual online or anything. But uh, these... Actually, no, I look at it. These do seem... I, think to be connected together. Um, these then connect to tracers that also go out to this and then directly to the CPU. So I have a suspicion that this is breaking out lots of useful CPU lines. So uh, this looks like eminently hackable, particularly as this is the main software in two EEPROMs. So, hey, I get two free EEPROMs, which is nice. So, in order to make this do anything useful, I'm going to need to provide power through this connector here. And I want to know what all the pins do. Now, one option is to remove the power supply from the chassis. But I think instead I'm going to try and figure out what the power supply pins do by powering it up on the bench and poking at it with a voltmeter and then see if I can power the uh, the logic board from my bench power supply because not really very comfortable with having um, a live mains power supply sitting on my desk. Okay, so I couldn't come up with anything better than this. Uh, I've turned this switch to on, uh, but the circuit breaker it was plugged into is off because I don't want to touch this switch while it's live due to the big live copper wires coming out of it. So let's provide some power like that. Now, hopefully the logic board should now be live. So we should be getting five volts here, I would think. Yes, we are. Um, assuming that black is 
ground, what do we get here? 14 volts, 12 volts, nothing, nothing. Judging by the tracks, I think these two are both connected together. I'm willing to bet that the red and black wires are 5 volts for the logic. These two are high voltages for the printer mechanism and probably the floppy drive. And that these two wires are common ground for both of them. So after doing some track tracing, a few interesting things have shown up. One of which is that I was wrong about most of the ports. So the two printer stepper motors plug into these two, which are identical. So if I were interested in the printer, plugging them back in again will be interesting. This is actually the video output port, which is weird given that it's diametrically opposite the video controller chip. I've traced the uh, the output lines from this through to this chip, which is a driver, and then from there to this connector. The two pins at either end are ground, and the three middle ones are signal, V-sync, and H-sync. So turning that into composite video won't be particularly straightforward. I have found out that the UART pins from the processor here get routed through to this connector. So this is a serial port. However, this, the keyboard port, does not seem to be connected to the UART. So I am not sure where this goes yet. I still have to figure out where all the pins go. So I think what I want to do now is to uh, add some header pins to this connector here because I want to be able to access the serial port. Okay, moment of truth time. Let's apply some power and see what happens. I have the oscilloscope hooked up to the video outline, I hope. So we just need to connect negative here and positive here and see what happens. I'll just try it briefly at first. Whoops. That looks like a signal to me. So let me try and adjust this while not blocking the view. Now this should be Uh, this should be the video signal, so this should be showing the pixel data. And on power up, we get some text at the top of the screen and some text at the bottom. This is honestly not really what I would expect to see. Nope, I am not sure what I'm looking at. Okay, let's try one of the other sync lines and see what we get there. So, power off. Let's try this one. So, this should be either H sync or V sync. So, there's a pulse, there are lots of pulses. Still does not want to show us the frequency. Why is it doing that? Oh yeah, uh, it says top f 47 volts. That is incorrect. This is because I have the crocodile clip set up rather than the 
10x probe um there's a way to change that not that yes i can't be bothered to try and find it so this is either uh h sync or v sync so the horizontal tick size is 5 milliseconds, so that should be 5, 10, 15, oh yeah, of course, period, 16 milliseconds. Uh, now I need to try and do that division in my head, which I'm unable to do. Let's try the other one and see what we get there. Aha, right. This is much more high frequency, therefore this must be the horizontal sync, which, again, it is not showing the frequency. Why isn't it showing the frequency? That's in blue. Is that because it's set to channel four? There we go. Yes, I'm, it must have been showing. Yeah, I don't know what's going on, but 16.4 kilohertz is exactly what I would expect for uh, TV frequency video, which is what I would expect. So let's go back to V-Sync because that will give us the frame rate. hertz right so that's reasonable now because it's not composite video it means I can't just plug this into my uh, AV to HDMI converter because that wants composite in I will be able to plug this into my OSSC when my OSSC arrives which I don't have it yet because hopefully I should be able to wire this up to a VGA plug. My actual monitor won't uh, like this signal because it only does VGA signals. It wants a 30 kilohertz H-Sync, which this isn't. Okay, let's have a look at the serial port. I have hooked up my cheap and nasty logic analyzer to all the serial port lines. I don't know what the pins do. I mean, I can trace them through back to the chip here and I know the chip pin out, but I keep losing track when counting the pins. So I'm just going to record them all and see what happens. So if we press the run button on the logic analyzer and hook up the power and stop, what did we get out? I think not a lot. Okay, I was rather hoping that we would see some debugging information, but yeah. Uh, it looks like it's not doing anything with it on startup. That makes sense. The port was probably put there for uh, use by uh, expansion hardware. I don't believe this is lined up anywhere in particular in the case. I will have a look at that in a moment. Okay, so the next thing to do is to dump the ROMs, I think. So this is really simple. It's just a matter of uh, removing them, sticking them in the EEPROM programmer. I won't record that. So back in a second. All right, I've dumped the ROMs, which were smaller than I expected. Each one is 64K, giving this a total of 128K of ROM. 
that will contain all the word processor software and the floppy drivers and so on. I saw messages in French and German, so presumably you can change the language by setting one of the configuration straps, and I found four so far. These two, that one's got a solder blob on it and that one doesn't, and these two. I was expecting jumpers, which is why I didn't see them earlier, and unlike the later models, they aren't conveniently labelled somewhere on the board, so... Anyway, I can't say it to English, so I'll just leave it as German. So, I think I've come to the end of what I can do with the board. The next thing to look at is the floppy drive. Further investigation shows that the floppy drive is probably a 240k model, the same as my other brother word processor, rather than the 120k one that I thought. But whatever it is, it's not working, so I'm going to remove that from the chassis and have a look at it. Well, that was miserable. In order to get the floppy drive off, you have to dismantle everything, including taking the monitor out, which is ridiculous. There's this one screw under the floppy drive. The floppy drive goes in the front panel like this. So you have to remove the entire front panel with the monitor CRT attached to it. Ugh. Anyway, it's off now, so let's take a look. Now, it's interesting the f way it failed. I was expecting that the belt would have died. But given that it was sort of seeing something on the disc, that makes me wonder if there's something else. Maybe it just needs a thorough clean. All right, let's take the lid off. It's a very odd floppy drive. And what do we have? Um, let me just grab a disc from somewhere. So, the disc goes in here, and it's, it's seated in place, and, ah, okay, that makes life easier. So this is the mechanism. We've got the flywheel. Aha! Do you see what I see? That's the belt. Oh! Oh, yuck. That's that's turned into sludge. Uh, oh, that's going to be awful to take off. I was expecting to be able to just pull and have it unreal. Uh, yes, I can see you just see fragments of belt inside, so I'm going to have to take the back panel off. And of course, this drive is so bizarre that a standard size belt, even if I had any, which I don't, would be unlikely to fit. Here we go. Oh, that's not too bad. I haven't had to deal with a drive that's completely sludgified, but... Uh, let's gently prise this stuff off. Yuck. Look. Oops, that was the bit. But you see the way it's just smearing. And this is the motor. And there should be a pulley that connects this to the flywheel. And then there's the flywheel itself, which has most of the belts wrapped around it. So let's just see if we can just scrape that off reasonably cleanly. I think we might not be able to. Yeah, 
yeah this is just what happens to old belts the rubber degrades and they turn into disgusting sludge it's a decent sized piece and it's sticky okay well that's cleft black smears everywhere so it's now time for the ipa and i've been using this little bottle for ages At some point i'm going to have to get some more preferably quite a lot more okay so you should be able to see the black stuff on the spindle Yeah, this is not going to be fun. So I think I'm just going to fast forward until that's finished. Okay, it should now, should now be relatively cleaned up. So what we need is a belt. Now, I don't have any drive belts, but I have had good luck with these floppy drives with ordinary rubber bands, which is not supposed to work. So, it's going round, and allegedly these square belts will automatically unwrap, uh, untwist themselves, but let's just do that manually, just to be on the safe side. Oh, nope. that has not worked. It's just wrapped itself, caught itself under the flywheel. Try that again. Yes, I might have problems here. Okay. So let's give this a try and see if it works. I'll just put the lid back on the floppy drive. The board seems to slot under into these two tabs and then the screws do up. It's really simple. You notice how few components there are. It's probably got dynamic head amplifiers and that's it. Okay. And there is one other important thing to do, which is to clean the heads. So get the IPA out again. I say heads, what I really mean is head. This only has one, which is on the bottom. The other side is a felt pad that just pushes against the disc. So. Just clean this off and call it done. Okay. So now I want to test it somehow, but this is so bizarre that the only way to do it is to plug it into the actual machine. Okay, it's time to power it up. I'm hoping that this thing runs off the same 5 volts as the rest of the board and not one of the high voltage lines. So, power. We get a beep. Now, it wasn't doing that before. Uh, right, it's, it's clearly got a prompt up. Okay, it's not beeping anymore. So let's try the file button, which if I remember correctly, makes the drive run. And nothing. Right. I wish I could see the screen, but I can't. It's unhappy about something. Interestingly, the current has dropped from 
480 milliamps to 340. Let's just reset it again and see what happens. Yeah, I think I am going to have to hook this up to the monitor to try and figure out what it's doing. That's a shame. So the beeping turned out to be because of the lid sensor. It was complaining that the lid was open and it refused to do anything if the lid's open because the printer contains some pretty powerful moving parts and can make your life a... you can make you have a very bad day if you get it wrong. So with a paper clip I simply jimmy the sensor. I'm not going to bother putting the printer back, I'm not particularly interested in that. But here we have the file menu, I can go to new document, type in something. Oh yeah, and Here's an interesting thing that I noticed from my other brother typewriter that this does too. There is no exclamation mark on the keyboard. Maybe you're just not supposed to be surprised when you're working on this. So to save a file, you press the file button. You say, yes, I do want to save the file. Name, hello, and then document is being saved, please wait. And there we have our file. And we can read it back again. Now the disk drive does make really unnerving mooing noises when it does stuff. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Let's copy it. Uh, I want to copy to another disk. So copy to the same disk, new name, new hello. And it is a 120k disk. You can see up there it says 115.7k. Uh, put the original disk in the drive and press return. Now it gets the directory. So, as far as I can tell, the disk drive works. So I'm now going to take the disk out and stick it in my flux engine and see if it's readable, which will be interesting to find out. Okay, so here I am now at my workstation. I've put the disk that I just wrote into the drive. So if I fire up flux engine using the new GUI, tell it I want to read a Brother 128 disk and hit the read button it will read. Now the 120k Brother format is in fact 40 track and this is an 80 track drive. So there is only data on every other track. However, because the Brother floppy drive track alignment is rather bad, we actually read all the 80 track tracks, including the ones between the 40 track tracks, which is where these bad sectors are coming from. There we go. So we should now have a good read. I see no red sectors. Now it's gone through and deduplicated everything. So we can write the image to, there we'll do fine. Yes, replace, close that. And Flux Engine comes with a completely unrelated tool for looking at brother disks. So there we can see the two files on the disk and I can extract one. And this is the data file that the word processor wrote. And I can write back files and, sorry, I can write back disk images and the brother will read them fine. It's actually rather happier about images written here than uh, on the word processor itself because these ones are properly aligned. Of course, the big question is, what am I going to do with this thing? The Z80 board actually turns out to be pretty decent. It's got 64K of RAM, lots of ROM space, 
a really rather nice video output, particularly to the monitor. I was expecting it to use composite video, but it isn't. So interfacing it to anything else might be tricky. I still want to try and make it work with the OSSC when it finally arrives. That'll make doing development so much simpler. The floppy drive isn't worth a lot. It's only 120K, it's a weird format, and interfacing it would be a pain. As the protocol is mostly software-defined, I'd have to replicate a whole lot of software on the ROM to actually make it do anything. I think the most useful thing I can do with this is to stick a Raspberry Pi in it, wire it up to the internal serial port, and turn it into a stealth writing machine. The combination of screen and keyboard should make that quite nice. I'm not particularly interested in the printer. I have daisy wheel printers, I don't have a ribbon for this, and besides, it appears to be broken. So I think I'll just leave it with the printer out and try and come up with something to plug the gaping hole in the top of the case. When I do do something with it, I will report back. I've uploaded the ROM dumps and things. It's a shame I didn't get a dump of the character ROM, but I really don't want to desolder that thing. So, until next time, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.